Chiba kept trying. She loved him, and she wanted him alive. But in the last month, everything seemed to pick up pace. Despite all that had been going on, Chiba says, they were actually working to get pregnant. They had even tossed around possible names, Tuesday if it was a girl, Harmony if it was a boy. On September 19th, Elliot played Red Fest in Salt Lake City. It was his final performance. The songs spanned the years. There was Plain Clothes Man from the Heat Miser days, Needle in the Hay, Between the Bars. He closed with George Harrison's Long, 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 something he did often. I Love You, the last line in Harrison's song, were Elliot's last words to a live audience. In early October, Dorian was in L.A. With Valerie gone, her contacts with Elliot had become less sporadic. She was no longer cut off. She stopped by the house, and the two talked about Elliot's decision to go cold turkey, how he'd done it essentially overnight. She told him she didn't think it was a good idea. She said it made more sense to taper gradually, that doing so would be better for his body and his mind. But he wanted to have a child, he said. His plan was to conceive with no drugs in his system. He also felt that having a kid might help him get his shit together. Gary was happy for him, sympathetic, but once more she warned him, you need proper medical guidance to get off this shit, referring at this point to the psychiatric medicines, the benzos, the antipsychotic, the antidepressants. By mid-October, Elliot felt well enough to plan future performances. Fellow Lincoln High School grad Matt Groening was curating the All Tomorrow's Parties Festival in Long Beach, set for the first week of November. He had chosen Elliot to play, along with The Shins, Built to Spill, Mission of Burma, Modest Mouse, Sonic Youth, and others. We rehearsed for about two weeks, Sean Sullivan recalls. And Elliot was doing so well. He wasn't drinking or doing anything. He put on weight. He looked healthy and strong. He seemed, Sullivan felt, to be in a very good spot in his life. I remember thinking this is going to be good for all the people who care about him. They could see he was back. They could see he'd come out of the living hell alive, purged and rejuvenated. Yet around the same time, Elliot had driven to Malibu Ranch to check in with Schoenkopf. Schoenkopf remembers thinking he was not well. Apparently then, there were good days and bad days. Also, because of the nature of his relationship with Schoenkopf, Elliot may have felt freer to disclose. Clearly, according to Schoenkopf, Elliot was interested in the dark side. Yet... I don't remember any obsession with death, he said. I don't know that he had a death wish. On October 17th, Charlie typed out a letter. In fact, he typed out two, one to Chiba, and enclosed within it another longer one to Elliot. He told Chiba he hoped all was well with her, and said he enjoyed meeting her when he and Bunny had come to L.A. over the summer. He felt, he said, that she was a good person for Elliot and a good influence in his life. He asked her to read over what he'd said to Elliot and to give it to him if she felt it wouldn't upset him. He also asked her to let him know whether Elliot had read the letter because he and Bunny were planning to arrive for Thanksgiving. He included his phone number and email address, thanking Chiba for her help. The letter to Elliot is, in some ways, a brave, self-aware statement. He had written at least one other letter like this, several years before, also addressed to Elliot. Now he was more direct, focused on Elliot's intuitions of sex abuse, which he had heard about from Bunny. He starts by admitting again that Elliot's early life in the family was not happy. Again, he connects this to his deficiencies as a father, saying he lacked experience, 
that he was too demanding, quick to anger, judgmental, and downright mean at times. But he says he's changed. He's a different person now. He had made efforts, he adds, to see Elliot when possible, but notes Elliot's unwillingness to let either him or Bunny into his life. The sexual abuse he denies thoroughly. He admits it sometimes occurs in families in the U.S. and elsewhere around the world. He calls it immoral and depressing. Then he asserts pointedly that he's never had any urges to sexually abuse anyone, ever. Charlie does not say, I never sexually abused you, Elliot. Instead, he denies even the slightest thought of such behavior. It is a global rejection of a concept, almost. It is not personalized to the specific situation. He closes by saying he'd like to talk the matter over along with many other subjects. The letter's final paragraph is two sentences. He asks Elliot to take care of himself. Then he says, heartbreakingly, I love you. Elliot never saw the letter. October 21st was a Tuesday. It was to be taken up with errands for Jennifer. In the morning, she had a medical appointment. Her blood was being monitored for possible leukemia. Weeks before, she'd had a suspicious lymph node removed. Elliot drove her in her sob. He had to do it. She'd gotten a DUI. Test results look good, they were told. There would be no need for additional monitoring. The two left with a feeling of relief. Chiba was going to be okay. As they got home again, they reviewed the plan for the afternoon. Chiba had a therapist appointment. Again, Elliot would need to drive her. The doctor was Abigail Stanton. As it turns out, Elliot was planning to see Stanton, too. He'd ended things with Schloss, the plan being to make a fresh start. Stanton then would be taking over his care, managing his meds in the event he decided to start them back up again, this time more thoughtfully. Based on what Stanton already knew, she had concerns. In her view, Elliot's decision to go cold turkey from the psych meds was perilous, Chiba says. She intended to speak with him about it. Her idea was to evaluate and reassess. All of this was up for discussion as Chiba laid out the day's remaining agenda. But suddenly, Elliot interjected, Don't talk loud in the house, you know it's bugged. Chiba tried laughing the comment off, thinking she might neutralize it. She answered, I'm not paranoid like you are. Elliot was now on the computer. He called out, Are you working for somebody to sabotage this record? Are you working against me too? Overwhelmed by the emotion of the day, feeling hyped up and anxious from the earlier medical appointment, Chiba locked herself in the bathroom. It was something she'd done before. It was her way of getting some distance, a temporary respite. On other occasions like this, Elliot had called Ashley, who came by to mediate to talk Chiba out. This time, in the moment, he did not. He knocked on the bathroom door. He told Chiba he was sorry. He asked her to come out. He told her he knew he was crazy. He apologized for what he had said. But Chiba wasn't ready yet. Impulsively, as she'd said before, she told him to leave her the fuck alone. She was sick of the paranoia. For several long seconds, there was quiet, only the usual sounds of the ticking house. Then came an awful noise. A scream Chiba vaguely recognized, both familiar somehow and utterly alien. A few nights prior, she and Elliot had stayed up sharpening a new set of knives. As she flung herself out of the bathroom and ran to the kitchen, where the scream seemed to come from, she found Elliot at the sink. He had his back to her, but as he turned, she saw a knife in his chest. 
In milliseconds, her mind raced over scenarios. Was this a dream? Was it some kind of joke? Was the knife even real? What exactly was happening? Looking in Elliot's eyes, his expression was apologetic but also hard to read. He seemed half panicked. Not thinking, her hands did what seemed to make immediate sense. She pulled out the knife. Elliot then crashed onto the balcony as if she believed he were trying to jump off it somehow. She tackled him there, then quickly climbed off him to call 911, seconds later performing citizen CPR. For a split second, seeing the knife on the floor, she thought of using it on herself. The call was made at 12.18 hours. LAFD paramedics arrived on the scene, quickly transporting Elliot to a hospital emergency room. In the chaos, Ashley got a message from one of Chiba's friends. As she reached the house, two police officers were stationed out front, she later told Chiba. They said Elliot had been taken away. They told her Chiba was still inside, but they refused to allow any contact. In fact, at this point, Chiba was being questioned. She says the police forced her to describe the sequence of events over and over as if to trip me up. Then what seemed to be a suicide note was discovered. Chiba had been in the habit of staking post-its around the house, each with a little encouraging message. As detectives questioned her at the kitchen table, her eyes passed over one. On it, Elliot had apparently written, I'm so sorry. Love Elliot, God forgive me. There was no date. At 13.36 hours, after having what turned out to be two lacerations to the heart surgically repaired, Elliot was pronounced dead. Chiba wasn't there. She arrived one hour later, having changed into an Elliot Smith t-shirt. She found Ashley sitting beside a tiny, angelic, female African-American security guard. The two hugged, sobbing. It was impossible to believe. He'd always seemed bizarrely resilient, somehow indestructible. But now it was over. He was gone. The next day, Chiba found Charlie's letters in the mailbox. Ghoulishly, a package also arrived. It was from the record label Suicide Squeeze, which had brought out Pretty Ugly before, and a distorted reality is now a necessity to be free. Chiba took the discs to Sunset, where, in front of the figure eight wall, fans had gathered in mourning. She passed copies out to the people there, vinyl from heaven. Running through Chiba's mind was an endless barrage of woulda, shoulda, coulda. I was going crazy, she says. I lost it. In the moments before Elliot died, she had been thinking... This will never end. I can't do anything right. Yet, as he had told others on different occasions, Elliot said to Chiba, As soon as I am gone, I will unburden you. He was gone, but as events unfolded, she would be anything but unburdened for reasons no one anticipated. Elliot was cremated, this being what everyone concluded he would have wanted. The ashes were divided three ways. One-third to Ashley, one-third to Bunny and Charlie, one-third to the Smiths. At first, the plan was to hold a funeral at the home of Neil Gust and Joanna Baum, who were roommates at the time in Portland. For some reason, that didn't happen. The service occurred instead at the Smiths. The ashes weren't on hand because the coroner would not release them. Chiba was there, having made the trip from L.A. For the first time, she met Gary Smith in person. Sean Krogan, Pete Krebs, 
and Jason Mitchell were also present. Krebs in particular made a point of talking with Chiba. He wanted to know the story. He wasn't suspicious, no one was, no one had serious doubts at the time as to what had occurred, he just felt a need to get the facts from the one person who possessed them. For several hours everyone milled about, talking in small groups inside and outside in the backyard. There wasn't a lot of demonstrative grieving. No one recalls any memorial speeches being made. The mood was one of resignation, of deep, gnawing regret. In his cover of Cat Stevens' Trouble, Elliot had sung of death's disguise hanging on him. He'd asked it to be fair, to be kind, to leave him in his misery. He didn't want a fight, he sang. I haven't got a lot of time. Coda The Hero Killed the Clown From a standpoint of parsimoniousness, the philosophical principle that simple explanations stand the best chance of being correct, few causes of death could seem less questionable than Eliot's. He had been depressed and suicidal for much of his life. He had written songs declaring suicide's lure, if not its inevitability. As Pete Krebs said, his finger never stopped circling an inner self-destruct button, he was on it all the time. He frequently told people he wanted to die. Every new day dawned as if by accident, especially in his final few years. There had been several apparent prior attempts, deliberate overdoses. He was a cutter. Toward the end of his life, he'd taken to scrawling the words Kali the Destroyer across his arm in indelible marker to hide visible scars. He was paranoid, believing his record label was trying to kill him. And he'd impulsively stopped most, if not all, meds, his brain chemistry in gnarled flux. Plus, there was a note, along with a set of statements provided by Chiba. All this qualified itself irreversibly on January 6, 2004, when forensic pathologist and deputy medical examiner Lisa Shinen released her signed findings. Each of the two stab wounds entered the chest cavity, Shinen found. Only one of these, stab wound number two, not necessarily the second in terms of order inflicted, perforated the heart. This wound, therefore, was the likely fatal one. Toxicology tests revealed no illicit substances. But Shinen writes, All medications were therapeutic or subtherapeutic, suggesting psychiatric drugs were in fact present in Elliot's system. He was not entirely drug-free at time of death. But he was not abusing his legal drugs either. Nothing was untoward vis-a-vis -vis their levels in the body. In fact, one or some, Shinen does not provide names because they were already in the toxicology report and also non-contributory to death, were subtherapeutic. It's Shinen's second paragraph that leaps off the page. With it, and to this day still, Elliot's posthumous life was altered along with Jennifer Chiba's and everyone else's who loved him or cared about him or counted themselves a fan. Shinen called the mode of death undetermined at this time. Chiba was hurt and alarmed. She'd spent one year of her life caring for someone she adored, someone with whom she was trying to have a child. Now the insinuation was that she, or less likely, someone else, could be a killer. It was monstrously, inconceivably depressing. And not just for Chiba. No one, it seemed, had seriously considered a possibility other than suicide. If anything, suicide was predetermined, overdetermined, not undetermined. Yet with Shining's ruling, a new avenue opened up, especially for fervid fans who felt abandoned by their Virgil. 
Elliot was murdered, some of them declared. Chiba stabbed him twice in the chest. Shinin based her conclusion on five factors. She kindly and very helpfully answered detailed questions about each, along with a number of additional questions on peripheral aspects of the case, for a total of four pages of information. The atypical aspects of the case Shinin documents in her, in her report are these. 1. The absence of hesitation wounds. 2. Stabbing through clothing. 3. The presence of of small incised wounds on the right arm and left hand, possible defensive wounds, four, Chiba's removal of the knife, and five, her subsequent refusal to speak with detectives. Before getting into these, there is a broader question. Nelson Gary explained, as far as the possible murder, I know nothing really, but he went on to say, In existentialism, there is no valuable meaning in existence. But Elliot didn't live that way. He was a fucking perfectionist, always trying to tweak things and make things better. He added, Stabbing himself twice, there is just something wrong with that. It doesn't seem physically possible. When asked about this, Shinin replied simply, Your friend is wrong. It is indeed possible to stab oneself in the chest and other places more than once, especially in cases where nerve connections are spared. If the first stab wound does not hit a vital organ, Shinin said, and wound number one did not, there is nothing to prevent additional self-inflicted wounds. David Campbell, official spokesman for the office of coroner, told journalist Liam Gowing the same thing. In fact, he referenced a specific case, one involving an LAPD detective shot through the heart who stood up, drew his weapon, returned fire, and killed a suspect. We've had other stories, he added, where people have had injuries to the heart and they continued running and collapsed 30 yards away. So it is indeed a fact that a person can sustain heart trauma and not suddenly be incapacitated. So, what then of the first atypical element, the apparent absence of hesitation wounds at the site of entry? Shinin says there, these are less often seen with stab wounds, more common with slash wounds of the neck or wrist. But with stab wounds particularly, The person might simply obliterate the mark, stabbing himself clear through any small hesitation puncture. A lack of visible hesitation marks, therefore, doesn't mean the person didn't hesitate, Shinin explains. As for stabbing through clothing, Shinin's reply is matter of fact. People usually do not stab themselves through clothing, but that does not mean it never happens. It does. Elliot disliked showing his unclothed body. It made him extremely uncomfortable, according to numerous friends. The last thing he would ever do, and Shinin is not suggesting he did do this, is parade about the house shirtless. The notion, then, that in a moment of suddenly agonized impulse he'd think to remove his shirt is nearly untenable. Not only was doing so out of character... It also fails to jibe with the suddenness of the decision. He spied the knife sitting nearby, and he grabbed it. On this point, Shinin clarified her meaning. People do not necessarily take their shirts off if they are going to stab themselves, primarily to see exactly where they are going to put the knife, and secondarily to have nothing extra. Um... Primarily to see exactly where they're going to put the knife, and secondarily, to have nothing extra between the skin and the blade. This can be done relatively quickly, Shinin adds. So, most typically, clothing will be moved aside in one way or another, and Elliot did not do that. He stabbed himself through his shirt. On the other hand, as Shinin allows, people do sometimes stab through clothing anyway. The action is not unique. Of all the questionable elements, the presence of possible defensive wounds appears on its face most compelling. Yet these were very small, Shinin revealed. Plus, alongside the tiny incised wounds, 
and quite easy to tell apart, Shinin noted what she called round scars consistent with cigarette burns. Elliot, in other words, had been putting lit cigarettes out on his skin, another commonly encountered self-harm habit among many. Gowing says Elliot habitually worked a knife on top of scars left from these burns. He claims to have received this information from credible sources unwilling to go on record. That aside, the very small wounds were located on the left hand and right arm. Another on the bicep is in an odd location, Shinin remarks, for a defensive wound. At any rate, there are, Shinin says, other explanations. Perhaps Elliot mishandled the knife, she says. Perhaps he first tested the point. Beyond these reasonable possibilities, there's a larger, more obvious anomaly. If Elliot was indeed stabbed, not once but twice, unless he submitted to the act, essentially opening his arms and allowing it to happen, defensive wounds would be anything but very small. They would be plentiful. Even in his anguished state, he would have fought instinctively to live to protect himself. There is no evidence that happened, no indication of a fight. In cases of struggle, Shinin says, we often see long incised wounds on the palmer surface of the hands as the person attempts to block or grab the knife. These are missing. But what if Elliot had been blindsided with no time to defend himself? Here again, it seems extraordinarily unlikely that a small woman could enter a kitchen, grab a knife, and stab a person not once but twice with zero evidence of any struggle. Parsimony dictates a different explanation. As Shinin explains summarily, I don't think we can know with 100% certainty whether the incised wounds were intentional self-injury, testing the point of the blade, or defensive. Chiba says she pulled the knife out in a moment of thoughtless impulse. That fact also seems unsurprising. As spokesman David Campbell told Gowing, If you saw someone who was still alive and they have a knife in their chest, what would you do? The first thing you'd want to do is stop the bleeding, and you can't do that if the knife is still there. Shinin adds, I realize that it's a very human thing to pull out a knife. I realize that it's a very human thing to pull out a knife, but that can also turn out to be the wrong thing to do, since the knife would act as a plug or partial plug limiting blood flow. As a small consolation in the circumstances, Chiba says hospital personnel told her that pulling out the knife did not kill Elliot. He would have died anyway from massive internal bleeding. As for Chiba's subsequent refusal to speak with investigators, she claims she was interviewed three times at the scene. She told them everything she knew. There was nothing new to add. She had more than cooperated. Gowing says Shinin told him her gut feeling was that it was actually a suicide and that she ruled as she did to assist police who might pursue a homicide angle. He got me wrong, Shinin claims, but just by a bit. I said it certainly could have been a suicide for various reasons. That statement remains true. Even though at the time she compiled her report, several details of Elliot's life, some strongly suggestive of the possibility of suicide, were not available to me. She adds that the undetermined mode was, for her, the only viable option. If Mr. Smith had been completely alone when he died, it would have been much easier to call it a suicide, but there was another person present, and unfortunately this muddies the water. Moreover, we have to do the best with what we know at the time. It is important not to rush to call something a suicide, since the designation can be very difficult for surviving family to deal with on personal, religious, and sociological levels. I do not call anything a suicide unless I am absolutely certain. If there is anything irregular, I am constrained to be cautious. While I do listen to what police have to say about cases, I do not assign manners of death to help out investigators or to force them to do an investigation. That would be totally inappropriate. Finally, as for Chiba specifically and her possible role in Elliot's death, Shinin said emphatically, The undetermined mode is not an indictment of the girlfriend. 
Of course, that had been precisely the unintentional effect of the ruling. Chiba was never charged, but in the minds of a minority of vociferous fans, she's guilty, or at least under very serious suspicion. It's an attitude she still confronts almost daily. As did Shinin herself once when a completely dishonest fan, saying she was clearing things up for a friend, in effect misrepresenting herself, to Shinin's great irritation when she later found out about it, asked for an interview, the results of which she posted on a website, in the process misquoting Shinin and getting various things she said completely wrong. As an aside, it is worth noting that after decades of scientific research into precursors of violence, one variable reliably surfaces, history of violence. Recent violent acts predict, albeit not especially powerfully, future violent acts. Chiba had no history of violence. Alternatively, some fans have proposed on message boards and blogs an intruder theory based on a hackneyed drug deal gone bad scenario. Shine In finds that possibility unlikely for a host of interconnected reasons. There would have been signs of a struggle in the home, as well as clear defensive wounds. Also, even though she had locked herself in a bathroom, Chiba would have heard something and told the police about it later. Finally, any hypothetically ticked-off drug dealer would have brought his or her own weapon, a gun for instance, rather than making random use of a nearby kitchen knife. As for Chiba, when Elliot died, she had every reason to believe she might be pregnant. She was in love and she had no reliable means of support. Elliot was everything to her. She devoted her life to keeping him alive. As Sean Sullivan put it, she was solely committed to him. She got him to doctor's appointments. She kept him going. She'd drive him from rehearsal in his little black Passat. If it was not for Jen, it would have happened two years before it did. Plenty of people told Chiba the same thing, she says. For Sullivan, the idea that Jennifer Chiba murdered Elliot Smith is totally retarded. Others, very few in number, and including not a single person interviewed for this book, with the sole exception of Jerry Schoenkopf, felt inclined, at least initially, to imagine otherwise. Chiba says Gary Smith made a call to her therapist, Abigail Stanton. He asked her, Do you think Jennifer could have killed my son? She said, No, absolutely not, Chiba maintains. The only person Jennifer is capable of killing is herself. If Chiba made any mistake, it was understandable and hardly murderous. She locked herself in the bathroom. She wasn't available in that moment. She wasn't responsive. Elliot was afraid of losing me on several different levels, she said. He had formed this almost unhealthy attachment to me. He'd say, Chiba, you're the only reason I'm alive. If you leave me, I'm killing myself. The breakup with Deeran had been traumatizing. He could not endure any similar ordeal. It was too much to contemplate. Suicide, therefore, equaled pain cessation. It was a kind of preemptive strike, a world killer, leaving preferable to being left. And as Eliot always liked to imagine, it was, paradoxically, in the fractured logic of hopelessness, a gift. I can't prepare for death any more than I already have, he sang in King's Crossing. It's true. He'd practiced. He'd come close he possessed the requisite courage. He was, in this way, fearless. But he was also scared of being alone. He couldn't make it on his own. He'd burned too many bridges. Friends did not know him anymore, they said. They felt stupid for trying to help. They just wanted everything to be normal. We should have left all his records playing on his doorstep, Autumn de Wilde says. He wrote all the right lyrics for our complaints. 
Death was the final unburdening, a formula Elliot always espoused. There was no good reason not to do it. There never really had been. In Elliot's car, a CD was found after his death, with 15 different versions of the song Stickman. It's a buoyant, upbeat number, beginning with guitar that almost seems out of tune, like his life by this time. He sings over and around a constantly repeating, bending single chord. He shoots blanks at emptiness, he says, the ammo dead, the world dead. He reloads to make a silent sound, killing nothing but time, spinning the world on its flip side, listening backward for meaning. In one version, the song's a dirge for a depth that dropped even lower. Remember that when you hear some sad song, he suggests. It's a print he shot in reversal, a reverse shot, as in film technique, when two people appear to be reacting to one another, one on stage, one off. The frames, he sings, go one by one. But if you speed them up, it's clear he's on the run from some monster off-screen killing sons. This is the fear that never left him, revisited in slow-mo in a movie he draws from memory. Mental pain, he concludes, is the sharpest knife. It's the one he always carried. It sharpened itself. And in the end by a means far more plausible, far more clear, far more unavoidable than any other, and far less open to any serious question, it killed him. There were two knives. One, the sharpest, was always in his heart. The second was almost a redundancy. That is Torment Saint by William Todd Schultz. The Life of Elliot Smith. We're going to talk about this book and wrap it up with some commentary next video. But for now, I want you to think about Elliot Smith and appreciate him and love him, which is why we're here. Thanks for listening.